Um, so I wanted to ask uh, John uh, because whenever I think of you, um, as I was just saying before we uh, start recording, I have a flashback to us being on a coach uh, driving from um, where was it? It was uh, I'm trying to think which uh, Garden Nord, wasn't it? And we would get we'd have to cross Paris. Um, pick up a coach and then go to Quartermere, which is where Bill Bonner's uh, chateau was based. And we'd sit on the back of the coach, and invariably, because we were all geeks, we would talk about coffee. You think we would be boozing and partying, <laughs> but everybody was talking about coffee. And I can remember always since then. I can remember you would always have the latest piece of technology as well. You were the first person I saw with an iPad, <laughs> and you had your, your pen there, and you did this thing. And you were using that for research, and you were showing me. Um, like post-it notes and everything that you were using, uh, which remind me of Will Self, who writes all his books on post-it notes. But you were showing me how you go through when you're doing your research, uh, you're getting all these notes and putting it all together. And it's always stuck in my mind ever since. So I wanted in this talk to basically look at two sides of research. A, looking at the research of um, looking into the product, looking into what you're writing about, and then B, looking into researching who you're writing to. But I thought, to begin with, could you give us a little bit background, and it might have changed over the years, we were just saying, um, how, you, how you would start the process of research when you're looking to write copy? Uh, sure. Uh, I mean, like a lot of things, I think uh, a lot stays the same and a lot changes. But I, I mean, I, I think even back further to when we met, which uh, I'm not sure even how long let's, ago that let's was. Let's talk about that years. strange night. 15 years, maybe. <laughs> Um, no, definitely a longer than that. Um, anyway, uh, I mean, way, way back. I mean, uh, I'm I'm okay with dating my age. Uh, we're, we're talking now, like 25 years ago, maybe 30 years ago. Um, I was going to the library and taking out books and looking on microfiches because that was the only way you could do things. But um, but even then, I had a a strong belief that uh, it's very hard to conjure up ideas out of nothing. And I have ideas all the time. I'm jotting them down on those post-it notes, on napkins, on lots of things. That's at least that's the way it used to be. Um, now I jot them down on the iPad, but uh, which t is much better for my wife who doesn't have to clean <laughs> up the post-it notes. I leave mine around, but. Um, I, I think that I think that uh, the idea that when somebody says they have writer's block, I have always felt like the cure to writer's block is so easy, which is talk to somebody, read something, listen to something, take something in. It is impossible not to have new ideas when somebody else is out there triggering triggering you with things that they've done, and uh, and you, you know you might. You might find ideas of theirs that you can borrow, but you are also going to find new ideas because creativity itself is uh, is not the idea that you're creating something out of absolutely nothing that's never existed. It's usually it's like a spark that jumps between two existing points. So you've got some kind of experience of your own. Somebody else has has some kind of experience that they've recorded. When you put the two near each other, that's when something jumps out. So that's why I think that that research itself is so valuable. And I still hold the same type of belief, but I don't necessarily do the research in the same way because the way we access information has changed so radically in that time, many times over. Um, I mean, it, it's different now than it was two years ago. Uh, do, do you mean in the sense that um, it's it's more readily available the the stuff that you're looking for? So once upon a time you right. would have to kind of um, it was almost as if the the secrets that the, that research produces um, for for copywriters and stuff the, the little nuggets of knowledge they were kind of hidden, but now they're kind of they're everywhere. So it just yeah. changes the way that you might pick things up. Um, but at the same time, it reminds me of the sure. The Mike Palmer quote where it's you, you've got to become the expert of something to be able to um, then tell the experts something. How do you know which exactly. pieces of research are the ones to pick out? Well, uh, I, th I think uh, part of it, 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 it actually comes, it's kind of a process that's difficult to pin down because you're circling the ideas all the time. So you, it, it's hard to go at it straight one way or straight another. Uh, you really, I think, 
the, the most important thing is you start in a mindset. Uh, and that mindset is, um, I'm going to flip on a switch in my mind that makes me hypersensitive to anything that is related to this thing that I'm writing about. So um, that's why when you start doing the research, all of a sudden you feel like everybody you know is talking about the thing that you're writing about or every, every show has got something about it. So um, every, whatever, every, every article in a newspaper. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, so, um, so that, that hypersensitivity, I think, uh, is a sign of somebody who is a good copywriter, a good personality for being a copywriter. Um, because then you know that you're plugged in. But today, yes, the information is much more readily available, um, which has its pluses and minuses. Uh, you, you know, back then, it, for instance, you're doing, if you do research mostly from books, you know that those books have been something that an author sat down with for a year, two years, five years, carefully cultivated, rewrote, etc. Now you do your research from articles that are a page or two long that they had to write in, you know, five hours because the thing happened yesterday. Uh, you know, anybody is writing about politics in the world today or the coronavirus today. Um, they're rewriting this stuff. The news is changing on an hourly basis. So uh, it, you, you just have to, uh, you have to react faster, but you also have to realize that the, the material that you're getting may not be as accurate, may not be as carefully thought through, or even if it is carefully thought through, may not be timely by the time you use it. So uh, that's part of the challenge. Um, but yes, you need to be, you need to become an expert in the thing that you're writing about so that you can communicate with and get the trust of the, of the expert uh, or product, pro I usually say the product champion. Uh, somebody because you know you and I are both writing for a lot of information products so we would consider that expert somebody else who's uh, dispensing that information but somebody might be selling health products they might be selling a physical product they might be selling a service or so it's a little bit different you're not going to so be writing for an editor or a, a guru which we, we do in the industries where we are, but just somebody that's the founder of a company or somebody who invented the product or somebody who's offering the service. But that person, whatever function they serve, is going to have some kind of genius about what they do or some kind of strong feelings, at least, about what they do. And some kind of emotion, some set of emotions attached to the thing that they do, or they wouldn't be able to keep doing it all the time. Um, that's especially true of somebody who's a founder of a product or a company uh, because that is a very personal thing. It's an extension of them. So you want to talk to them about what they, you, you want to you dig in and get that backstory, why they did it, not just what it is that they do. Um, this comes and back in to, order to, to the why right. question, isn't it? You've just got to keep digging right. why on, those, on that founder, on that, the person, the champion of that product, right. whoever loves it because they do have that story, but they might be so familiar with the story that they just, exactly. like, oh, well, yeah, yeah, they don't, you won't find it interesting, but it's like, no, no, I need to, that's the bit. Sure. And, and, and in that, uh, which is a good, that's a good segue to the uh, thing I was, I was going to say, which is that um, the, the expertise that you try to develop when you talk to them is so that both so that you can ask them the right questions um, and so that you can spot the things that they're not so sure are important and you know to dig into them. Um, and also because of this idea, you know, this, we always kick around that, that David Ogilvy thing that he, somebody asked him, what is the characteristic that you need to focus on if you're going to hire copywriters that they were hiring for the Ogilvy and Mather agency. And he said, above all else, uh, education and background and everything being the same, it's the level of curiosity. So if somebody has an intense level of curiosity, they are going to be somebody who wants to know something about everything. Um, and that when they're having that conversation with that person that's going to talk about something, uh, or even with the customer, or they're going to be trying to find out how a product works, 
they're going to be asking all those questions, just like a little kid who's out there. He said, why is the sky blue? Why, is the, why are the trees green, et cetera? Um, because those questions have to be asked because you don't know where the nugget is. So you, you've got to be curious. And you yeah, it's funny. I was, I was literally just before we were talking, I was just watching a, an interview with Paul Auster. Um, who I'm a big fan of uh, reading. And I'm, I'm writing a little section of, of my book at the moment about the fact that Paul Auster has written the same book basically 30 times, but like, that's fine. And <laughs> that's the whole point he's exploring. And it's all about when you know, when something's finished, it might never be finished. You're always seeing this thing, but he was in this video, he was just, explaining that as readers predominantly and, and it, it does tie into this you mentioned about being a sensitive reader and mm -hmm. he was saying that most people consume a book maybe in the same way you would consume a tv program you're just looking for the story you're looking for the plot to go through it and it's a bit of a kind of it's a frivolity it's something fun and that's cool and they enjoy it that way but then he said, but then a sensitive reader, and he said, you're missing an element there because there's actually the music of the, the words, the phrases, the way right. it's been written and that. And, and if you're a sensitive reader to that extent and you can w watch the construction of the piece as well, you enjoy it on a different level and on a, another level. I think that's what you're talking about there is the same thing as that curiosity and the, the sensitivity to the information around you. So when you're doing that research, two people might go in the same room, interview the same chap or woman who's founded the company and go, why did you found this? Oh, it's to help the uh, people who are in this place that need um, bigger stamps. And mm -hmm. you go, all right, cool. And you go, well, that's not really, and one person might go away, right, let's run an ad on the fact that they invented this for bigger stamps. And it's like, great. God knows if this metaphor is going to work. But the other copywriter would go in and go, well, why? And they go, oh, because... Right. Um, you need bigger stamps. You go, well, why do you need bigger stamps? And they went, oh, because I was once in Uganda and I saw the shaman and he was trying to send a letter and he couldn't affix the stamp to the thing. And you're like, oh, right, okay. Well, that's quite interesting. That's the, the nugget that's going to give me something to go and write a much more interesting ad. And it's that element of being a more sensitive um, reader of the story of the research that allows you to be more curious or right. rather allows you to get the copy nuggets that you can use and go away and and kind of find the real detail of that. Right. Uh, but, but from a technical point of view, then, because I always do like to labor things on just a purely practical and technical. These days, you mentioned about like not doing the post-it notes as much. Do you, are you, you, you apply a sensitivity, like you, you said, I think there, to like you turn, you turn it on, you say, right, I'm now going to be more sensitive to this thing. So you start noticing it everywhere. Um, do you do, do you start with a project and then kind of go down that alleyway or are you always open to these things and think oh actually i'll keep that because that might apply to something or, or are you more project-based these days um i am well I, I think it's i think it's multiple paths uh i mean one one thing that i think that you always have to do and um uh, i can't remember who it was but it was an it was a copywriter that uh, i I used to meet with somebody who was well known, uh, maybe Dick Sanders or somebody, long time ago. Was saying that you, uh, Lee Troxler, I think it was, um, copywriters who were uh, in the nineties. They might still be big now. I don't know. I haven't kept in touch with them. But um, was saying you've got to be constantly plugged into everything. You've got to be watching uh, contemporary movies. You've got to be reading you know, what, what might seem like junk articles that are kind of around the ideas that you're in. Um, always consuming stuff, I think, because you never, you never know when it's going to be useful. Uh, and you never know when you're going to stumble across something. Um, plus, I think it just keeps your mind engaged. Sure. Um, and, and in the same vein, you know, I, uh, you're working remotely now, I'm working remotely now, and now all of a sudden the whole world is working remotely and they're trying to figure out how to do it. Uh, and we've been doing it for years. Uh, and I, I think one of the things that, uh, you, know, you know, when people were dreaming about doing this, not imagining they'd be thrust into it, um, they don't realize how much con connection you have to have with people when you're remote. Um, and the reason for that is because you've got to be in the middle of the conversation as much as you can. You know, there was that great uh, Steve Jobs story uh, that it's in his uh, biography, and there's also it was also in the um, in this book called "Where Good I Great Ideas Come From" or "Where Good Ideas Come From." 
uh, Stephen Johnson. Great, it's a great book. Um, and it was about this kind of, uh, at some point you need this environment of random connectivity. The ideas just have to collide with each other. So uh, the Steve Jobs thing was that when he was setting up the offices for Pixar, you know, when he left uh, Apple and started up uh, Pixar and they, they set up their, their headquarters, he made sure that the design put the bathrooms in places where they would have to walk across this room to get to the bathrooms. Um, because when people were going, or presumably more likely when they were coming back, um, they would meet up with somebody and just start having these random conversations, and those would lead to ideas. Uh, I, I, whenever I'm in the States, I usually go to Philadelphia, and then I go down and visit Baltimore just to hang out in the offices because I just stumble across. You know, even, when, even if I don't have meetings, I just try and, you know, can I come in and just hang out in your office for a while? Um, because things come up, yeah, and I, I always walk with stuff. Have how people, as you say, it's, it's that, it goes back to that writer's block thing where people say like, oh, it, it, I don't know what to write, or I don't know how to do this. It's the, the easiest way, and I, it, it seems ridiculous because I get asked these questions all the time now and what have you, but the, this, the solutions are so ridiculously simple. Just speak to people because they, 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 there are ideas in those people that as soon as you connect with them, they're going to say something they might not realize. Exactly. It's, it's a good line or it's a good uh, idea right. or it's a good little kind of phrase or terminology or just the, the way someone speaks. Um, but when, because you're sensitive to those ideas, because you've turned your kind of sensitivity on, when they say it, you're like, well, that's brilliant, we can use that. And it's, it's often those ideas from the other person. That's it. So, so the way to overcome it is just to go to speak to someone and just to talk. It is right. interesting, I think, at the moment with like the remote, element and I think people aren't realizing um, like working from home the biggest challenge for me um, as, a, as a writer as a copywriter is the um, is keeping connected with people the, the irony yeah. is is you've got to try and it's all, it's all great and yeah you can get up a little later and you can go for a walk and you can do stuff and you can eat more biscuits than you should during the day kind of thing mm -hmm. and consume far much more tea but the problem is is that you are isolated and that you will slowly right. down the vine if that's the case. So you've got to go out. So ironically, everybody's going, oh, I'm working from home now. I'm, I'm sat there two weeks in going, I really need to get out because I've, this is what I'm used to. Yeah. I go to cafes, I speak to people, I'm just getting ideas all the time. So you've got to kind of be sensitive, but also yeah. speak to people. That's where you get ideas from. So, yeah. so that's where you get ideas from. Let's, let's move, flip, flip it to the other side a little bit. Um, that's when you're looking for around what to write about, looking for details on the products or services that you're selling. Um, the other side of the equation is obviously the person you're writing for, and you you can't just assume that it's generic person number 15 who's going to receive your, um, your letter, your piece of copy, or read this stuff. So you need to build up a picture. So I remember, again, very years ago, um, the foundation of my learning was – you, you used to talk about uh, a series of questions that you can just ask um, of a reader um, to kind of get that pitch in your mind. I, I wondered if you could expand on that and just tell about how do you research who you're writing to? How do you build up a picture of that reader? Um, well, if I could just kind of like uh, mush it together with another uh, questions that we had talked about prior to recording, which is um, the, way of, the way of collecting information. Um, so, uh, let me just get some technical stuff out of the way first, which seems like I'm not, not answering the question yet, which is, uh, so now, now what do I, what I do when I am doing research is I do use a, a lot of technology to do it. Um, I make a lot of recordings. Uh, you, you give me this kind of laboratory situation right. in my mind. I'm thinking now. So, so, lab uh, uh, so there's a, a voice memos app. On the on the iPhone, sure. This one on the, uh, on Android. Uh, I'm a total Apple Watch thing. Uh, for a while there, I had a uh, an app on it right on the face that I could tap that would start a recording. Uh, but I found that it was randomly bumping into things, and I was recording conversations for hours. I'd be like, "That got a six hour conversation here. What is that?" Um, but uh, so I I I try to record a meeting. Uh, I sit down right away with 
an editor, uh, a guru, uh, product champion. Um, and I try and go in armed with some information that I've read that that person maybe has written or uh, where they've been interviewed or something like that, just so I have uh, enough of that terminology that I can have the conversation. And then I try to get that person talking. Um, part of the reason that I do that, of course, is because that person has intimate knowledge of the product or whatever it is that we're selling that we're not gonna get anywhere else. Um, part of it is, is uh, because that person often shares their profile with the person you're marketing to. So um, they, you know, like attracts like, so they're, they're often like, a, they're often a similar personality, similar concerns, just at a different level of sophistication um, as far as the product goes, uh, or different level of awareness of the solutions. So simply by doing that first part of the research is a good way to get a, a base in trying to figure out who it is that you're marketing to. Um, because the people who are radically different from the people who are selling to it, they don't share, and I don't just mean uh, in physical demographics or you know how much money they have or something like that, but just in their ideology. Um, if they're very different from the people they're selling to, it's very hard for them to connect with those people. So. Uh, so you learn something about the customer right there just by digging and delving into the, the product and the people behind it. Um, and then um, I'm kind of still mixing that uh, the technology along with this uh, answer to your question. Um, I keep, uh, I, I constantly have, in the beginning of doing research, I have so many tabs open on a... Uh, on any given subject that my browser is on the verge of crashing and it often does crash. So I then have to go and save off some of the tabs. Um, and I'll go and I'll, I'll read those. I have uh, books in my Kindle app um, or in the, in the books app. I actually use my Kindle app for business books and the book app from Apple for personal reading that I find interesting. Um, but that's similar to something that we used to talk about. Yeah, I think we probably talked about it that copy me in years back at the Chateau, which was uh, another way to figure out something about your customer uh, used to be to go down to uh, the, the a Borders bookstore to Noble and look at what's on the shelf in the area that you're going to be marketing something because the spines of the books are curated by an audience that's going to be buying those books and the sellers who are trying to sell to them. So it's not going to tell you something that they're interested in. And it also might give you an idea of something to read by somebody who is writing to people that they understand very well, because that's why they've written the book. Um, so that's another way to research a reader. But now I just go to, uh, I go to Amazon and I, I look for a book that's by the person that I'm writing about or appeals to the person I'm writing about. I ask them what they're reading. And uh, then I look at the recommended things at the bottom. And I look at the comments that people have made underneath because that's another way to figure out those customers. You get a little kind of a quick profile. Um, so I'll have, I'll use the book apps. That'll be loaded with uh, that'll, at least one or two books, maybe several books, which I'll read through, sometimes skim through or highlight stuff because you can then, you can sort just the highlights and look at those to refresh yourself when you need to write. Um, and then I think, uh, you know, I, I'll look at, uh, social media areas that, that might have something to do with that. Um, usually I'm just going to come across those when I'm researching for articles. Uh, and those articles are often going to have comments by readers underneath. Um, you know, these days, uh, you can talk to people. If you, if you get to know the client that you're working with very well, you can get, involved in parts of their operations. So, uh, for instance, uh, you know, when you call a customer service line as a customer and they say this may be recorded for quality purposes, those recordings are in a file on a, on a disc, which can be shared and they, uh, this may shock people and make them nervous about calling customer service lines, but, uh, people do listen to those 
to make sure that the customer service reps are doing the right thing, but also because uh, people like me can listen to them or a product manager can listen to them um, and find out what people care about. Um, and it, and that may sound, I guess, invasive or, right? I mean, we don't know, we don't know who the person is or anything like that, but we do hear the things that are on their minds, which is something that wasn't available to us as easily before. You had to go and sit in customer service, get on the line and, um, calling up those recordings was difficult, but now it's, it's just one, it's a folder with a long, you know, a bunch of MP3 files and, um, and they can be useful. I haven't done that as much as, as I should, I don't think, but I have a big one, like an hour long customer service call sitting on my, in a tab waiting for me to listen. Uh, and I think it'd be very interesting. I mean, you, you lots of has done some strange things to people. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know, but yeah, no, it's 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 it's, yeah. it's a great point, and it, it, you say about the uh, customer service thing is something I've always done. Like I always used to get on the uh, in the room where the customer service team was, listen to the calls. Um, I, I did that from when I when I before I became a copywriter. I used to work in uh, the local council in the council tax and housing yeah. section, and the calls that you would get would give you such an enlightening. Uh, picture of the people that are ringing in and getting this stuff and that stayed with me forever but it, it's it's interesting actually because you say about the amazon reviews and the comments and everything and it all speaks to the same thing it's it's looking at a the customer's language is a really um good benefit yeah for doing that you get to see yeah. how people speak so as far as your copy goes uh, on a kind of purely language basis you can start using the customer's language but also you say as well what the customer cares about and uh, the amount of times that you will get um, a group of marketers and, co and copywriters in a room all going down this pathway going, oh yeah, we've got to worry about this because this is what people care about. And then what you actually realize is that all that this reader really cares right. about is the fact that you've got a HTTPS secure page on the order form. And if that's the thing, and no one's thought about that because we're all sat there thinking about this right. thing and that thing. And it's only through looking at those um, those comments, those those almost seemingly banal things that you go, oh, well, that's not, we're talking about a big idea here, like we don't want to worry about mm -hmm. that stuff. But it's that stuff, it's those obstacles and those objections that um, are revealed when you look at the customer themselves. And these days, as you say, there's, I'm, I'm, yeah, there's the customer, um, customer service transcripts and stuff like that. If you can get to those brilliant, um, social media is an obvious one of seeing how people talk to each other. But even then, like Amazon reviews, I'm not even, I've not even thought of that really, that there's the Amazon review mm -hmm. thing. And there's basically a massive list of possible objections or even um, possible uh, positive uh, opportunities. That right, people sure. go, oh, we, I really like this because, you know, well, mm -hmm. pick that out in the benefit of the copy, um, which I'd not thought about before. So it's all about right. just finding those ways. And again, Ironic because we're in a situation where we're talking under isolation and you can't communicate with these people, but you just need to um, connect with, like you would connect with the product owner on the product side, you've got to connect with those mm -hmm. customers as best you can. And despite being locked down and being in these situations, as you say, there is all these ways, Amazon reviews being one of them, um, to go and find out what people are saying. Um, and you right. need to do that actively, don't you? Right, and, you know, I think, and I think if there's another another aspect, and I <clears throat> jotted down a note to just remember to say something about. It. Oh, and I also want to show that I I use uh, uh, I, when we we just moved recently uh, about um, two months ago, a month and a half ago, um, just in uh, under the wire prior to the lockdown because it would have been impossible to move <laughs> afterward, but. Um, one of the things that came with it is see boxes and boxes full of my notebooks and I have to go through them. <laughs> and I said uh, to my wife today, uh, it's like, well, you know, I'm, at, at least now I've started doing this. I, when I, sometimes I just like to write by hand. So I write by hand in this app called good notes and I use a Apple pencil to, to do it. And, and I have it set up so that I have yellow legal pads that I write on. And you can search the text, like searching type text and things like that. So it's pretty nice. Um, I mark up promotions there too, and things like that. All of which 
by the way, is another way to research your product and research your customer because you look at the promotions that worked, you, you know, um, and take notes on those. That's going to, that's going to give you a lot of insight into what's working for the, the prospect too. Um, but, uh, where was I going with that? Um, now I have piles of, I have f files of notebooks that all fit on one iPad, which is good. Um, Files is and better than piles. Files is better than piles. My wife wants me to go through the piles <laughs> and, and, she, and see what I can throw out. And I said, well, I have to record them. She's like, well, can't you just type in what's in the notebooks? So it's like, if I type in what's in 20 years of notebooks, uh, I, I might as well just retire now because I won't be done until I'm 80. You could, you could use it as a the rote learning exercise for junior copywriters right. to, to, type it, to type it out. Yes, <laughs> this is the best thing for you to type my <laughs> notes. Uh, but um, but uh, there are some questions you can't ask the prospect because they're not uh, able to answer them, and they happen to be the most qu important questions to get answers to about the prospect, which are... Um, you've got to find out what it is that they believe about the world. What, what ideology do they carry with them always? Um, and what they similarly, what they believe about themselves. Um, and related to that, you have to find out what they want to believe about themselves because ideally a person is in some form of transit of some form of self-betterment, which is something I think people understand really well now that we're in this uh, lockdown situation. They're kind of getting a little reflective and trying to become better at this or that. Um, people have aspirations. People have beliefs. Uh, and then also people have an experience of the world right now, a filter of the world, that they may not be quite aware that that filter is shaped by their experiences, possibly incorrect um, or narrow uh, because those are the kinds of things that we spend a lifetime trying to figure out. Um, but you need to be able to figure out what that filter says to them because you're only going to be able to communicate through that filter. You can't go around it or past it or um, in any other way than, than, than they're going to let you do. And then you have to understand what it is they believe about the world because if you confront their beliefs directly, you're only going to be able to do that so much and you're going to have to do that in a certain way that they don't feel uh, insulted, challenged, um, attacked. Uh, so they need to be able to trust you and, and they trust you because they feel that you understand what they believe and you care about what they care about. And uh, you need to understand how they feel about themselves because some of that might be a good feeling that they're proud of and you need to let them know that you understand that and you respect it. And some of that might be something they're ashamed of and you need to be careful about how you talk about that because they're going to feel hurt or attacked if you attack them for it. Um, and it also gives you an idea of what it is you need to promise them because that aspiration is the most important thing to them. That aspiration is what uh, combines with their fear uh, to keep them up at night. So they're either desiring to be something that they're excited about or they're desiring to be something and afraid that they won't be able to achieve it. Um, so all those things, they're very difficult to, to say directly to somebody, what do you believe in? What are you afraid of? What do you, uh, what do you care about? What do you want to be? Um, it's hard for people to answer those questions to somebody they don't trust yet. And even with somebody they trust yet, it's hard for them to put them in words. So that's why you're digging around in all these kind of sideways, reading the stuff that they've written, trying to read between the lines in those uh, posts on social media and those responses. I, I was just going to gonna products, say, the, the, the how, when you think about the how do you do that, there is, there's no real cheat or um, like, no. oh, it's like this. You just have to, as you say, read between the lines. That comes from you being curious about the world yourself yes, as a copywriter exactly. and understanding um, exactly. or c critically analyzing, critically thinking about 
everything from politics to um, to socio-economic statuses and all this kind of yeah. stuff, and just standing a little bit of scants of everything and going right. Well, I might be that kind of person, or sorry, if that person's like that, they'll believe this. And you might think, well, that's a bad thing to believe. But if you are trying to talk to that person, you need to understand that. And it's right. it's only by kind of your own knowledge of the world and building that up and then being able right. to spot and go, right, well, that's this product owner is like this. They've done, they've produced this for this type of person, which is a a version of me my belief is this so that gives you one clue then you go into the thing and you can see the right. responses of that person they're saying yeah i agree with that this is thing why are they thinking that well it's because they don't like x or y or because they're worried about this and so it's just all about building that picture up that final bit and that's potentially the magic or the the the, the top level skill of a copywriter or a right. good advertiser I, I think it's because it's 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 right. a bit more un intangible it's a bit more abstract that element. exactly yeah to be to be interesting you have to be interested and i think that that's you know in, in a nutshell I, I think uh honestly i meet a lot of copywriters and i think they have a similar uh personality type which is uh to be interested in what other people care about um, sure. and i think it i think it it uh, shapes the personality of the writer after some time or maybe that it, maybe it's chicken and the egg. Maybe it, this business attracts people that are like that. I don't know. Yeah. But um, we, we all. But end, then we all end up weird, John. There's, there's no way. <laughs> there's no way around but it. I, I mean, like, I, I, it's it is just very funny in in having met so many copywriters. I, I mean, I see you've got your your Rickenbacker back there and the, yep. uh, and the guitar. I noticed that the other day. You know, back there, minor hanging on the wall in the other room. <laughs> I've got the the other guitar over here and the the piano over there. I'm taking piano lessons in, in confinement. So, um, I, I think, uh, writers tend to be, uh, they tend to be musical. They tend to be, uh, have a pretty good sense of humor and like to laugh a lot. And those kinds of things, I think, uh, indicate a personality that is interested in, getting in touch with those kind of, I don't want to be touchy feely, but getting in touch with those uh, abstractions sure. that kind of bubble under the surface for people. That's what makes you a better writer is that you, you can plug into those things and not address them directly, but definitely address them. Sure. Yeah. So no, just be, uh, be weird, listen to music, uh, listen to things, but that's it. Lyrics is yeah. another form of art, isn't it? Like you take on yeah. more than the phrases and we've not talked about the te the technical side of writing and the, yeah. The, the music of writing and all that kind of stuff but but it is just being curious and, and when it comes to research to round this off it's as you say it's about asking the questions it's about making yourself um i like the idea of just turning on your sensitivity to um what's happening around you and you can do that by listening by being interested um and by just asking that question through the process through the products from the product uh, creator and I, I, that's a great little idea that that's kind of like the uber version of the, the consumer it's like they mm. ultimately produced it for themselves in a way so if you can follow yeah. that path you'll get to that person and then following that person down why are they there why are they doing that and then adding the the magic that surrounds all great pieces of copy is when as you say it conform it con confirms an idea an ideology it it supports a fear. It speaks to right. that. It's, it's, that's the magic at the end that allows you to do that. But you can only do that by reading a hell of a lot and uh, taking notice. Yeah, I think it's true. And then I do think that, like, at a, just to bring it all home, I do think there is a point uh, where uh, I find that the um, that the research gets very frustrating, and I, I feel anxious all the time because I'm over researching. So it's the same kind of feeling you get with. Uh, writer's block, but on the, on the other end of the spectrum, where I'm reading the same thing the same time, I'm, I'm rewriting the same idea in many different ways, um, keep supplementing the same proofs, throwing in many more uh, little darling ideas and tangents and stuff than I need to. Um, and that can be a disaster. So sometimes I will just say, you know what, it's time to stop and just start writing something and I will clear the decks open a blank document or I'll get out my uh, good notes thing on the iPad and I'll just start writing. Yeah, I was just, it's funny I laugh because the PS is 
once you've done all that research, you've kind of got to forget about it and you've got to trust exactly. it. Exactly. Throw it, throw it away and then see what comes back. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I, sometimes I'll say, I've just got to do it. I've just got to write a page. I've just got to write down this lead idea. Uh, because if I, if I ignore it and keep researching, it's just going to eat at me and I'll be terrible to be around. So I'll sit down and start writing. And then eight hours later, um, you know, I've written 25 pages and I'm almost done. You know, I, there are, there are times that I, that I've said, just to hell with it. And that seems like the anti-research approach. Then I go back and when I redo it, I, I'm more, I'm more able to go and support it with the research rather than let the research drive the message. Sure. So there's no, there's no right or wrong way, but yeah, I, I, I think you're right. It's, it's about being sensitive, being open to it. Uh, but then yeah, that, that disclaimer, you've then got to forget about it. I just read a, a biography of uh, Dave Brubeck on the musical side of thing on the piano. Oh, cool. But yeah. it, well, it, I, I hoped it would be cool. It wasn't cool because it was clearly someone had over-researched and then okay. kind of written out the research. And I realized that there's a, to write biographies is a very different thing to just doing research. It's got to right. be, you still got to write well and make engagingly. And I felt that they'd over and just presented the research. Right. And I, I feel as though we've been talking so much about research. You've got to do that. You've got to do the work, but then you've got to do the writing afterwards and you've got to make that right. connect. To it's, it is like if you've got to switch to another part of your brain yeah. and then you've just got to, uh, you've got to channel it. You're really only doing the research so that you're, you've got, uh, Equipped. Yeah, research is research. Research is sand and water and uh, steel and rivets, but it's not a building. You know that that sounds like a weird cake. But yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> perfect. Well, thank. Well, that's for another talk, John. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs>